Hello there sword friends, today I'm going to tell you about this sword right here. It is the European Longsword from Musashi. This is a prototype iteration that was sent to me for the purposes of review. I am going to do just that. I'm going to tell you about its features and what I like and what I don't like about it. Uh, before I do, a couple quick notes. One, I don't practice Hema. I don't know how to particularly use this type of sword functionally. So just take my my thoughts and musings as, as just that, that of a enthusiast, but not of one as an expert or a practitioner. So there we go. There's that caveat. Also, this was sent to me from Musashi. It's known as a prototype, uh, but it was sent to me for free for the purposes of review. So if you think that makes me biased, then there you go. Uh, it's also something I've seen on Cult of Athena for around $200 marketed as the Templar Longsword. Now, I don't know if that is this particular sword or not, though it, it bears some very striking similarities. Uh, but I believe you can get something like this for that amount of money. Uh, the th main thing I want to point out though is Musashi may change the offering of this type of sword. There's going to be feedback probably from this video and also that I've given them that maybe the next iteration will be more or less good. Hard to, hard to say. Anyway, uh, I'm going to tell you about this particular one. Again, thoughts cut with it and then eventually I'm going to break it. But, uh, but anyway, there you go. So let's get on with the, the ramblings. So this is the pommel. This is where I'm going to start. One thing to note, this is a peened sword, and you can see the, the little peen bit here is, is reasonably well done. It obviously could be cleaner, could be nicer, could be more apparent, more decorative, or more refined. But for $200, this is not bad. No ledges on here bite into my fingers overall. This execution is well within reason for the price point of the sword. The issues that I would maybe take with this particular pommel are primarily the ledges and transitions here. It looks aesthetically unpleasing, um, and I can kind of make out the wheel area, though nothing again bites or anything like that, though I think it, it just could be executed a little better in terms of the transition area here. Uh, these ledges are uncomfortable, but not so much so that it really deters usage of the sword or, or is really, you know, uncharacteristic again of a sword in this price point. What I do take issue with is the little sharp ledges in here. Uh, they bite into my hands if I grip the pommel. <laughs> well, if you don't grip the pommel, maybe that won't be a problem. Maybe you could fill these in with some sort of epoxy or resin and then sand them smooth. But as they are right out of the gate, these little triangular bits are really quite sharp and bite into my hand if I grip the pommel as I, as I tend to do with my big sausage hands. So this, this is a bit of a deterrent for me. It hurts my hands when I use it. And I am forced to grip the, the actual grip area here rather than hold the pommel, which is which is often more, more comfortable for me personally. Other notes about the pommel, it does not have really any kind of distal taper. It'd be nice to see it thin out towards the edge or maybe even swell up, but some sort of indication that it's not a symmetrically cast blob. Um, this doesn't have a lot of dimension. Though again, for a sword in this price point, it's not not unreasonable for it to, to lack that type of dimension. Uh, these stick out and jut out just a little more than I would like, and again, are a little sharper than I would like. So there's kind of general note about the pommel. The grip area. Now, what you can see here is what looks like a leather wrap with cord underneath. Uh, I can kind of feel what, you know, the, the cord under here, and it moves ever so slightly, so it makes me assume that there is cord underneath here. Uh, it does have a slight kind of taper in this direction, uh, but this way it's pretty much smooth and flat and doesn't have any kind of taper. I don't have any ind issue indexing the sword, so that is not problematic. It is ovoid in, in a way that allows me to index and know where the edge is, but it, uh, it, is, it is a bit bit hefty. Um, I don't really mind the grip, honestly. I think it's very comfortable on the hand, whether my hands were wet or dry. Uh, the only problem I had was this pointy bit right here. Other than that, the grip actually feels comfortable. One thing I'm perhaps less a fan of is this seam. Now, I've swung the sword around at this point in the review. It's been handled slightly, not a whole lot, but somewhat, and the, the seam has not come undone or become unsightly. It's, it's held up thus far in the testing, which I would say is a, a medium amount of swinging and some small degree of cutting. Uh, but this seam does give me some concern that it will come undone. I can make out the stitching. There is a kind of a flap here that I can feel with my fingers, though none of it is uncomfortable. This is not an uncomfortable flap. It's not bad. It's just just to say that it's present and, and makes me think it's, it's a part that will come unwrapped or undone at some point. We will find out later in the testing, but this grip is supposed to be leather wrapped, which that much I can see. There's supposed to be cord underneath here, and then underneath that there's supposed to be a wood handle. I don't doubt that that's the case, but eventually the sword will be broken apart and we will see for ourselves. Now a quick note about the cross guard. To me, something in here doesn't look symmetrical, like this one is a little 
lower or jutted up a little bit. It just, something about it looks slightly off center to me and I can't necessarily pinpoint where that is. I think this one is just ever so slightly bent and that could have happened in shipping. It, it's tough to say. Anyway, uh, the cross guard is, is not bad again for a sword in this price point. None of the ledges are particularly sharp. Nothing juts out or is uncomfortable to use. I would say that the transitions are not as good as they could be. So if I point to the transition here, you can see that the leather kind of goes under. It doesn't transition smooth. It almost has a slight ledge in here. Again, nothing bit me. There's no, there's no bad part to this, just that it could be better looking. In terms of the transition to the blade, you can see there's a pronounced gap. It almost looks slightly off-center. Uh, it doesn't seem to be in terms of where it sits in the in the cross guard. The blade blade seems to line up and be straight. It may be the cross guard that's just a little little off-center as opposed to the blade not being centered in the handle. Um, overall, though, the the gap is bigger than it needs to be. Again. A sword in $200 price point, not expecting this to be particularly tight. It's rare for me to see a $200 sword that has uh, no gap or is, is really well form fit. This is, again, perfectly within reason. Other bits worthy of note, these edges are tampered in such a way that they're not sharp or jutting out in such a way that they bump in you. This is maybe a little sharper, and if you whack it in your noodle, it's not going to be good. But if you're half sorting or trying to do some sort of movement with, with the cross guard that, uh, that is martial in some capacity, then maybe that's a good thing. Uh, you can see the the bits kind of swell out at the end anyway for two hundred dollars this does have some degree of shape and dimension and that much is appreciated in a sort of this price point i'm going to move on to the scabbard and the belt system the scabbard is supposed to be a wood core scabbard i think that's what it is at least it's hard i don't know if it's plastic but i'm, I'm assuming it's wood uh, underneath here there's no metal shape it's got a little leather stitched bit on here and so it, it does at least I guess look nice. It has a seam running along one of the edges rather than along the back and that can stand out if it's not something you're aesthetically overly fond of. The main thing is that this leather uh, is somewhat loose. I can, I can move it ever so slightly with my fingers and the belt system, well this one at least is very easy for me to understand. It's got a belt, it's got some loops and I don't have to do any kind of obnoxious tying. The leather that it's made from flakes and leaves kind of goofy kind of leftover residue uh, bits on my hand. Nothing's happening now, but when I tightened this around my waist, there were little black bits along the floor, and, uh, and the leather is flaking off ever so slightly. The leather that's used here is just not, not of a particularly high quality. Again, for a $200 sword that comes with a wooden core scabbard and is made of 1060 and all of these features, there's going to be some, some cut somewhere. So if you're using this for a, a belt system, you might want to plan on, on a plan B. The good news is that the suspension system that's used here is relatively simple and seems like it would hold on to an ordinary belt. So if you have some sort of other apparatus or rope to hold your pants up, then uh, the, the kind of dodgy belt that it comes with may not be necessary. Uh, these little bits for the harness system do move around, though honestly it seems to, to hold it up. In the limited amount of time that I've spent with it mounted on my hip, uh, it, it's stayed there and been comfortable enough to use. The mouth of the scabbard is covered in leather, though it's a little bunchy. Uh, still, I appreciate that it's covered rather than being completely open. Better view of the seam along the edge. And again, here you can kind of see it move under my fingers ever so slightly. There we go. You can kind of make out where it's moving just a little bit. Hopefully. One other quick note about the scabbard. It doesn't rattle a lot. It does rattle, but not... a not obscenely so, uh, and it, uh, it is pretty loose. It falls out relatively easily, and it has kind of an odd scraping sound. I'm not sure what metal this is made out of, but it, or not sure what, I'm not sure what wood this is made out of, I should say, but it does have kind of an odd sound as it's moving in and out of the scabbard. Maybe that's because there's debris or it's sanded or I don't, I don't necessarily know. But anyway, it doesn't rattle a whole lot. You definitely want to pay attention to it, though, because it will slide out pretty easily. Not that that's necessarily a bad thing, but I, I guess I like some level of, of retention on the scabbard. Um, that's a subjective thing, though, as far as I understand it in European sorts. People have said they're supposed to uh, be friction fit and not fall out when you turn them upside down, at least not with at least some pressure. Other folks have said they're supposed to come out relatively easily and that the changes in temperature and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, just know that it falls out. You decide if that's important or not.
Now we're going to talk about the blade, the pointy pointy stabby part, the part that most of you actually care about. And there are some good things to talk about on this blade and also some, some downsides. The downsides are really going to come in the dynamic side of things. Uh, but I will I will touch on that a little bit later. The good thing, this is supposedly made of 1060 steel. I say supposedly because I have no way of validating if it is or isn't, but that is what it's supposed to be made from, and Musashi has a history of working with that type of steel, so I really have no reason to doubt it. Uh, some things that I like about this blade, first and foremost, it is actually pretty clean. The lines are straight, the fullers are terminated in approximately the same place, or at least within reason. Uh, there's relatively few surface surface ripples, and I say relatively few because in the $200 price point, surface ripples are pretty common. If I look on something like Windlass, it looks like there's a lot of misplaced rough hammer marks. This, it's not perfectly smooth by any means, but it at least is uh, reasonably clean. Uh, the polish on it is, is not quite a satin polish and not quite a mirror polish, somewhere, someplace in between. It seems pretty even. There were little blemishes and imperfections on the surface of the steel from being uh, kind of rattled around in the scabbard, and that is, um, you know, pretty pretty straightforward. Uh, the center ridge is straight. It doesn't waver around. The edge also came, uh, well, effectively sharp. I mean, it came really razor, razor sharp. There's nothing that uh, uh, suggests that I need to sharpen this or do any work, and there's no pronounced secondary bevel that I'm able to see along the edge. It came uh, with a really nice, clean, crisp edge, and Musashi, from their experience in making Japanese swords at an economic price level, are are bringing that competency in, in providing an edge here. Very often in European swords you see a very pronounced secondary bevel. There are manufacturers that don't do that. Uh, just so happens that Musashi is one of them. The edge is, is very sharp and very well made and doesn't have a pronounced secondary bevel. Uh, the blade is also very rigid. This tells me that it's probably going to be very durable. Now, I've cut some things with this at this point in the review. I've cut tatami mats. It did very well. The edge uh, worked worked quite well in that. Um, the uh, I've also bashed some ice blocks with it, and, and it's held up pretty well to that. So the blade is functionally very sound. It cuts and it bashes, but it is also very thick. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the dynamic properties of the blade here in just a moment. Before I do though, I want to give you a couple close-ups of the actual blade itself. The first thing I want to point out is this tip. You can see that it looks slightly rounded while I was cutting. I, well, the blade effectively struck the concrete and you can see that it has been diminished. It's gotten a little chip and uh, the very tip has rolled ever so slightly. So this edge was whacked into my concrete garage floor and this is the result. So it is, it is pretty durable. This is a very good um, a good level of resilience. This is less damage than I would expect to see from a sword having been whacked in at relatively brisk pace into a concrete floor. It's maintained a reasonable level of sharpness, though not necessarily right here, and there's relatively superficial damage uh, to, the, to the edge, or rather the point. Well, you can see the center ridge being relatively clean, the fuller area where it terminates, The terminations don't just wander off, they're reasonably clean. Overall, a very handsome and well done execution uh, in terms of general polish and lines. Where I take some issue is the distal taper, and this sword is a honking heavy, heavy beast. It's maybe tough to get started and, and tough to stop. It's not very nimble in the hand, and it's very thick. So, I, as I noted, I have bashed ice blocks with this, and the sword is still very straight. Three. There's really no discernible edge damage, with the exception of the tip that got whacked into a concrete Three. floor. Um, and that's what I would expect from a sword made of 1060 and well, well heat treated. Uh, also, that is as thick and robust as this. It's not going to take a set or a bend very easy because it's a very thick steel bar. Now, not very thick by crowbar standards, but it definitely add some, some cumbersome feeling as you're trying to move this sword around. So one tip and one thing that I think has been a consistent recommendation to Musashi as they go down the path of making European swords from the, the people that saw this video when I unboxed it and gave my initial impressions is there should be more distal taper here. This should thin out and the point of balance should be returned a little closer to the hand. This really should be a lighter sword for the size of sword it is. And I think most of the weight is coming in from a, almost a complete lack of distal taper, as, as in it's about as thick here as it is out here. And if it were thinned down, that would pull away ounces from the blade at the, at the tip, and it would 
it would make for a much more comfortable and dynamic feeling sword. Now hopefully Musashi is able to preserve whatever resilience you're going to see in this video in a thinner version, but that I think would really make this sword come to life. If there are two recommendations I could give, it would be to thin this blade out with a distal taper and remove this nonsense that bites my hand. Those are, those are my personal things, but at least I think everyone is probably going to unanimously agree that thinning things out here would be a recommendation. Now this isn't necessarily bad. If you're a backyard cutter and you want a really, really durable, bashy sword and you're on a budget, then this is, this is that. It's more robust than many of the offerings from the Hanwei Tinker line because it's a very, very thick, robust sword. Now there's no particular need for me to just, sh just tell you when I can show you. This is a Hanwei Tinker Bastard Sword. It's perhaps not quite as analogous to this sword as uh, as some other options, but it's what I have on hand. And what you can see is that the Hanway has some degree of distal taper. Not necessarily a lot, uh, but it also narrows down towards the tip quite a bit more. This Hanway piece feels a lot more nimble. It moves around a lot more. It's granted a different sword, and again, not an apples to apples comparison, but the Musashi is just so beefy and so thick all the way through that it makes it a much more cumbersome cumbersome thing to move around. Now these are known to break a little easier than probably something like this will, but this also feels more like a weapon. A sword is a little bit more elegant a thing. It's not an axe. It's not a hammer. Uh, granted, in some cases they might be used slightly like that, but it's supposed to be nimble. You're supposed to be able to put this tip where you want, get the edge where you want it, and start it, stop it, and swing it. Uh, at least, I believe you are for a sword, sword of this type. So, uh, if it were a little thinned out, then I think it would compete better with swords in the same price category. At least, that's what I would, I would assume. Now I've talked a little bit dynamically about how the sword swings around. It's heavy, it's uncomfortable, it's not, not a very fun sword to move around, but it is fun to smack into things and see it return completely unscathed. Uh, with the minimal cutting I've done, the edge has held up well. There's not a lot of abrasions on the steel. Overall, the sword has, has held up thus far in the cutting. Now it's cut some water bottles, it's had an unfortunate uh, meeting with a concrete floor, and I've chopped some ice blocks with it. And realistically, it's basically done all the things and a little bit more than you would expect it to do. It should cut the time mats, it should cut water bottles, it should frankly be more damaged from a concrete floor, and it could have easily bent, chipped, or had some other other problem from whacking, uh, whacking frozen ice blocks. Uh, but it didn't. It's held up well, and I think thus far Musashi has shown that the blade itself is of reasonable quality, and that, uh, that it can be used for sword-like activities um, without expecting it to, to fly apart at the handle. Uh, that said, we will see how much further it goes. At the moment, though, I just want to give you my thoughts as it relates to the sword thus far in the review, having done the things and maybe a little bit more than what the sword should do dynamically. It's not fun to move. So if you're looking for a sword that is fun to move, I would say that this is not, not the best pick of the litter. If you're looking for something durable, it certainly falls within that category. It's very uh, cost-effective at, at around $200, at least the, the versions of it similar that I can see online right now. Uh, and it's and it's reasonably presentable and well-made sword. It's a display piece. If that's your thing, then uh, then it looks handsome. Hopefully, the video will decide if it's uh, pretty enough to be added to your collection. But thinning it out and making something that doesn't bite at the handle as much would be my recommendations thus far. Do I think it's worth two hundred dollars at this point in the review? Yeah. I mean, a sword that does sword-like things to me is going to be worth two hundred dollars. It's heavier than it should be. I think there's probably better options depending on. Uh, if you're looking for something that feels more like a weapon, but if you want something robust and something that's going to be a decent sword, there's some pleasantness here. The edge is good out of the box, which is important to me. I suck at sharpening, so having that has been has been nice. Right out of the gate, I could cut things. And if you're looking for something that uh, trains you a little bit and is harder to move and maybe going to be more forgiving of bad cuts or uh, backyard shenanigans, then this isn't necessarily a bad thing. At 200 bucks, it's it's proven itself to be a durable piece. Uh, even though it may even though it may not be terribly representative of the uh, medieval European sword or or how a sword necessarily should feel. Anyway, I'm going to continue with the review. I'm going to do more destructive destructive things. I'm going to go whack it into things that you shouldn't necessarily do. So at this point in the review, just know I'm going to do things to the sword that really you should not do, and I'm not expecting it to survive. At this point, I'm trying to break it. So I suppose let's see how it goes.
Okay. Pommel came off. If that wasn't apparent. So, grain structure wise, see if I can zoom in closer here. I mean, this is very coarse. I am not a metallurgist, though. Uh, inherently, this does seem seem rough. Obviously, I don't know that I see a spot where it was cracked or problematic, though. But obviously, it did not hold up. So aside from that, I don't see any really significant damage to the edge. This, uh, based on where I'm seeing the, the pine sap, this appears to be the part of the edge that I was hitting with. I mean, obviously, you can see it's spread over a bit of area, but there's no, I mean, this part of the edge appears sharp and, and overall pretty good. So at this point in testing, I am not terribly comfortable with swinging it around anymore. The pommel has come off, and I wish I had noticed that earlier, uh, but <laughs> with that, there's no mechanical connection holding this on. It's really just glue as far as I'm aware. So while the blade has held up, um, I guess at any point this could turn into a helicopter of death. So props, I suppose, on the blade itself, but but at this point I, I need to I need to call it. Um, the blade could do more. That's certainly worth noting. It's also worth noting it's it's on there. I can I can whack it into stuff, and it's still it's still not moving. But I I'm apprehensive about really giving it full force required in the rest of the destruction testing because I, well, it's just going to loosen up and shoot out. So I guess let's see what the rest of this stuff is made out of. Okie dokie, sword friends. So I have just taken a bit of Windex, cleaned off the sword, and in a nutshell, I can say that the sword has survived remarkably well on the blade portion, obviously not, not the handle portion. It is, uh, I'm really, I'm really having mixed feelings about continuing, but I should not. Because obviously, the sword has had the pommel pop off. So I am going to do a couple quick uh, whacks with the hammer and see if I can't get this, uh, this peen bit out. I thought I would bring you along for the journey. So if I take this and... Well... That did not do much. Another bit to note, so this edge right here has not <laughs> diminished. It didn't really get a chance, but maybe if I just cut one of the, the fabrics here, we can see if it loosens up. No, not discernibly. Well, this came off pretty easy. Okay, let's stop pulling. So it's kind of messed up here, but I'm gonna cut the fix. And the fix, take away easy. You can see the leather is torn here with the right leverage. I suppose that's not really surprising. The leather also appears tucked under here, so so it's ripping away. That maybe explains why there's a ledge, but also but also the leather isn't overlapping and looking rough. So here's the cord wrap. Um, now I would have liked to see this uh, basically wound around really tight. I imagine this provides some level of resilience. Uh, because if, if the core were to have cracked, then presumably, or presumably this would have, would have held it together somewhat. Is it faster? Yes, I can. I'm going to try and break this apart in a way that you are able to see with your eyeballs through the camera. Ah. Okay. 
Well, uh, a couple positive notes about this. What I don't see is a ridiculous amount of epoxy. So, frankly, I'm a little surprised that it was holding on as well as it was, and it gives me uh, some some degree of happiness that I stopped when I did. I'm surprised that it is uh, sticky, as sticky as it uh, as it is, and worked as well as it did. But as you can see, this is not just filled to the brim with epoxy. You can see there's this, uh, here's, a, here's a piece with some of the, the black epoxy left, this chunk. Anyway, what I don't see is it just being used grotesquely to fill voids here. I don't see it just coating every nook and cranny of the, of the tang. Overall, this seems pretty well constructed. Um, the, So why this broke, I'm not exactly sure. It doesn't look like there's a welded section here. As we move up the tang. So this is the glue resin. And <laughs> really the only connection between the, the handle and me, myself swinging at a log. Now the shoulders of the blade actually look pretty good overall. I mean, they're not wildly out of square or overly bad or anything really uh it seems seems quite a shame that the blade broke when it did i mean granted i am somewhat relieved because that means i don't have to go back out in the cold but this is uh this is an unfortunate spot for it to break and i whack this with a hammer if it's weak then it will also break all right doesn't seem to Okay, so maybe just a weak point. So if I take this and bend it, I don't want it to snap. Bend it yay. So I'm probably at an 80 or 90 degree angle. And my vice moved, but maybe for the better. So what we can see is that the blade Return to straight. All right, sword friends, I'm gonna wrap things up and tell you, do I personally recommend the sword or not? In a nutshell, no, after destruction testing, my recommendation is removed. Earlier in this review, I noted that I thought the sword was good. For $200, it did sword-like activities quite well. I'd cut the tommy mats, I'd cut water bottles, and granted, I didn't have a whole lot of cutting footage, but the sword cut really well. It wasn't terribly nimble, and my gripes were mostly about some cosmetic thises and thats, and some uncomfortable hot spots on the, on the pommel here, and also that the blade was a little unwieldy, but but overall, I thought it was a pretty good sword for $200, at least if you're looking for something that's beefy and, and supposed to hold up to punishment. But as soon as I put it through some punishment, granted, it didn't break on ice blocks, but at about four strikes in to a, a pine log, uh, the pommel popped off. Now, as I was destructive testing, I'm expecting to see uh, some blemishes, some dull spots on the blade. Maybe the blade cracks or breaks at the point of impact or where it's flexing the most or somewhere else, but the pommel just falling off after four strikes is, is enough to take away my recommendation and say, no, I don't think that that's good. In fact, this is a manufacturing error. I don't know, there's no part in the process of manufacturing, at least as I understand that makes me think that every sword is like this, but this is the one I have to test and this one broke after four strikes and that's, that's not a good thing. Also, to my, my own discredit, I should have noticed this. This is an incredibly dangerous thing that I'm doing, testing swords, and uh, to not notice that the pommel fall, falls off after four strikes and to continue testing in a destructive manner for over a minute uh, is, is pretty stupid on my part. I'm glad I stopped when I did. The only thing holding the handle on was the glue and the, the tension and friction of the handle being on. There was obviously no pin, no other thing holding it together. To the sword's credit, it did not come off. Even with repeated hammer strikes, it didn't come off, but I would say that's, that's a lot of dumb luck on my part and something I would not want to leave to chance in the future. If you decide to, to buy a sword like this, you might want to whack it with a hammer or at least be more perceptive than I am if the pommel falls off in a hard strike because there's no guarantee that the glue or tension would, would hold that on. Now, how much did the cold impact this? I don't know, to some degree it probably did, but I would say not enough to make me think that that's the cause of it. If it were cold that, uh, that would cause the sword to break, I would venture guess it's not going to be the pommel that falls off but somewhere else down the blade. So again, I want to note that it is cold. It was 20 degrees when I tested this. That does have an impact. 
but I, I think this probably would have come off if it were 30 or 40 or 50 degrees as well. Anyway, uh, that is, is kind of my thoughts on the sword. I, it takes my recommendation away, but I do think that Musashi is still a company that you can buy products from, and I wouldn't hate on them for this specifically. And I don't mean to make excuses for Musashi, but I have had other products from them that are good. And furthermore, this sword has a lot of redeeming features. Obviously, I beat on the tang with a hammer, and it didn't really do much other than bend ever so slightly, which frankly it should when I beat on it with a hammer. The blade is still straight after being flexed 90 degrees. There's a lot of good things that show some competency in making an effective, durable product. And Musashi has made many katanas that I have tested, and they have held up, especially even relatively inexpensive ones, have held up pretty well, and I haven't had this kind of issue from them. So as a company, would I say all Musashi things are bad? No, of course not. I wouldn't. I would still be happy to test other products from them. I would still be happy to use them. I would still be happy to buy them. But uh, if you're asking me would I recommend this sword for $200, no I would not. This is this is not an okay thing to happen, it's not an okay thing that I didn't notice, and, and there we go. Anyway, those are my thoughts on the sword. I hope the video has been interesting. As always, cheers, and thanks for watching.